Everybody should have an outline that says 10 crucial issues for the church from 1 Corinthians. It's on the vertical orientation of your paper. That's what I'm going to work off of uh, tonight and uh, kind of going to approach this a little bit differently than I normally do this type of, of study. Uh, I would suspect that you're at least a little bit familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians. It is a church. I mean, it's a book written to the church uh, in southern Greece, uh, the city of Corinth. It was a, an ancient city. Uh, it was an old city when the Apostle Paul came to it and, and preached the gospel. It was a vile and pagan city. It was notorious. Of course, it was a port city. It was a city uh, where there was a, a lot of commerce. And, uh, with those types of things, typically go uh, all types of carnal vices. So it was a very decadent uh, society, and I would say in some ways similar to what we're looking at in our world uh, today. Sometimes we are quite shocked at what is celebrated and affirmed in our world today. I would say for the most part there's nothing really new that these sins have been around uh, since the fall. And so what we want to do be the light in the darkness. We want to push back against the darkness. We do not want to affirm that which is evil. Uh, we want to stand for that which is, is true. I know Drew did the book of Romans last week. We typically think of Romans as a book that is heavily doctrinal. In fact, I think he said something to you along the lines of, uh, again, going back to an outline, very easy outline. First 11 chapters deal with doctrinal matters. It's doctrinally dense. The last uh, 12 through 16, what is that, five chapters? It deals with practical issues, application of theology. Uh, Therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's what you do with what you learn. And so as I say, I think the book of 1 Corinthians gets a little bit of the, uh, the, the short sheet uh, treatment. But I think there's a lot of doctrine, and I think there's a lot of important things for us here. There are things that are relevant to us as a church. Uh, a lot of you young people, you're, you're moving toward the upper end of those teenage years. You're going to soon be adults. And you're going to be thinking about adult things. And you're going to be making adult decisions. And you need to have godly convictions as you move forward. And so, uh, let's begin to, to look at these things. I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time on each uh, one of these. But let's look, first of all, at the foolishness and the centrality of the gospel. If you'll look there, beginning in verse 18 of chapter uh, 1. Paul wrote, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, amazingly enough, and I, I sat with a young couple, uh, in fact, I've been sitting with them fairly frequently over the last month or so. They're not members of this church. You don't know. Don't try to figure out who they are. You've never seen them before in your life. So, but basic questions, tell me about your conversion experience. What is the gospel? And, uh, you know, your thought that I'd ask them, can you tell me how to build a nuclear bomb in the basement? In that they were quite befuddled about that. And, you know, years ago, I, I heard some guys say, you know, if you cannot explain your theology, and I'll, I'll just kind of amend that, so if you cannot explain your gospel to a 10 year old, you haven't mastered that gospel that hasn't mastered you. Okay? And so we need to be able to quickly, again, to give uh, the reason. The apologia for that hope that is within us. And so, why is the gospel foolish? Well, think of it from a worldly perspective. You're telling me that this guy, that you're claiming was born to a woman that had never been involved with a man, and he was actually, what now? The God-man? That, that he was both fully God and fully man? And this guy never did anything wrong. He never sinned. And again, so many people might even go have that category. But then they killed him. 
And you're saying they was raised from the dead? Now either one of two things. Either, either he wasn't dead, it was a hoax. Or somebody lying about seeing him after they put him in the grave. Something's wrong. But you're telling me that this guy that never started a business, never ran a nation, never led an army, this guy is the person I'm supposed to trust for my eternal salvation. Pretty silly idea, isn't it? From a worldly perspective. And so the world sees it as foolish. But now there's another category. Paul doesn't use it here. But I, I, I hear this constantly. The category of harm. The gospel is harm. Because it, it is based on the presupposition that you're a sinner who needs saving. And the idea that me, and more importantly, God, the Word of God, condemns you for your sin, for your attitude and action, is an atrocious idea. It is a horrible offense in the current culture. And so you need to know what the gospel is. You need to understand that it is absolutely essential. There is no church. There is no salvation apart from this gospel. And we're going to state clearly what the gospel is a little later uh, tonight. But I want you to notice uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Now, does anybody here know the significance to what was then Center Crest, now North Clay, of this particular passage of Scripture? Joey, you're nodding your head. What, what's the significance? That's the first... Uh, that's the passage from the first uh, sermon we preached. It's that's it. Christ. That's it. I determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ in crucified. And then that, that really gets at the gospel. It is the person of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But, but here, here's the thing. And I've been hearing this for years. I need sermons that are sort of life giving, life affirming. Life application. How do I be better? How do I do better? You know, all of these things. I determine to know nothing among you. No godly good. No, 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 no foolish, you know, how to work for a jerk sermons. You know, how to live with a jerk sermons. And here's the thing. If you're, no, I'm not going to go. Forgive me, Lord, for even, even, say, even thinking such uh, things. I'll just say that none of us are real bargains to live with. We'll leave it at that. But we have determined for it's Jesus Christ and crucified. You think, duh. That's what the church is all about. Yeah, that, that upon this rock, the confession, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. You'd think that'd be good enough. But the modern church thinks they've got to have something else. And actually they demand something else. And we're exactly those that Paul would write to Timothy and speak with them. Those that would gather to themselves. Those that will say what their itching ears wants to hear. So, the foolishness and the centrality of the gospel. Issue number one. Second issue, chapter three. What I call the myth of the carnal Christian. Now, I stirred up the hornet's nest not long after I preached that first sermon, Joey. Uh, I went down to my good brethren at the Birmingham Baptist Association and I had a little talk. Everybody's heard me mention this before. But uh, three myths that are destroying the Southern Baptist Convention. Imagine me, a young punk like myself, talking to a bunch of old buck pastors uh, about what I think is destroying the Southern Baptist Church and the entire evangelical world. But one of the points was the myth of the carnal Christian. The divorce from, as, from Christ as Lord as to the role of Christ uh, as uh, Savior and the perversion of the perseverance of the saints. Okay, uh, We're messed up on all three of those things. But the concept here that is lifted out, taken out of context, and mis mis misunderstood is found here in chapter 3, verse 1. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual uh, people, but as people of the flesh, as sorrows, as carnal, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not ready Ready for it. You are still of the flesh. You're still carnal. You're still sorrow. Okay? Now what is Paul 
saying to them. He is saying that you are still thinking in worldly categories and you're acting in on ungodly motives and you're not seeing your life, your world, your church, everything through a prism, through a lens that's saturated in the gospel. You're thinking like babies. The, a theology got kind of introduced about 150 years ago. There was a man named Lewis Berry Church Chaper founded Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, and uh, he came up with the concept of the carnal Christian, made very popular uh, through both Schofield Reference Bible, Ryrie Reference Bibles, and then ultimately a little pamphlet that if you're a baby boomer, you know exactly what I'm going to talk about, called the Four Spiritual Laws, given out by Campus Crusade for Christ. I think they have taken the offensive section out, but my bless my dear mother's heart, she had a whole drawer full of, full of them, and so I've, I've managed to wrangle with you, and I, I rankle more than a few of the old guard when I criticize this little four spiritual law track. But in it, he's, he says there are three types of individuals. There's the unbeliever that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's the believer who is filled with the Spirit that has Christ on the throne. And then there's this third category that he's really saved, but Jesus is not on the throne of, your heart, of his heart. And there was a little diagram that you could you know, see that. And folks, there's no such thing. Now notice my modifiers here. Of a content, happy, satisfied, perpetually sinning child of God. Okay? There's no such thing. If, if a true Christian is living in an unbroken pattern of sin, if they're, if, if they're not the most miserable wretch in the world, the real issue is we're not in the world. Okay? And so, do Christians act carnally? Do they sin? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We're not saying we're perfected in this life. We are not. But, uh, and y'all know my, kind of the presenting issue. You know, I don't know what y'all think. I don't know what you do at home. Y'all may be the biggest reprobates in the world when you get home. I don't know. Please don't tell me you are. Okay. I don't know that. But let me tell you what I do know. I got a pretty good idea who's here on Sunday and who's not. And what does the Bible say about that? When you feel like it, you ought to go to church. But if you don't feel like it, it's okay if you don't. It's right there in the text, right? Isn't it? It says, don't forsake the sin of yourself. Yeah. So if you're in the habit of doing that, it says, you know, there's some in the habit of doing that, but you ought to pay more careful attention to this issue as the day draws near. And there's only one, one way that day is, due, is drawn. It's near. Okay? I don't know when it is, but it's coming. And so... When I see somebody that's complete washout, complete dropout, they're living in a perpetual season of sin. That's not me judging. It's just me taking the word of God and saying, that's the deal. Again, I'm talking about those that are sick and all of that type of thing, shut-ins and so forth. But a true Christian loves to be gathered with the people of God. He hates being absent. He's miserable in perpetuating that. Okay? So, there's really... In, in terms of kind of the modern conception of I can live like hell but go to heaven, it ain't so. Okay? You just, yeah. If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a horse. Always remember that, right? Everybody got that one? It walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's what? Okay. All right, third issue church discipline, chapter 5. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that's not tolerated even on Facebook, on Facebook. A man has his father's wife. Then he goes on, okay, kind of gives some of the details of that. Look at verse 9 of chapter 5. Evidently, there was a letter that preceded the book of 1 Corinthians that we do not have. Okay. But he says, I wrote to you my letter not to associate with sexually more people. This is this. Everybody gets mad at him for being sarcastic, but you need to be mad at Paul too. Okay? Because look what he said. Not at all meaning the sexually moral world, the Greek that swims for a doctor says, You have to need to go out of the world. Yes, take the gospel to the unbeliever. 
But those people that display these characteristics that make the claim of being a brother purge that evil person from among you. Deliver, verse 4 or 5, deliver this man from the Satan. Put him outside the boundaries of the church. You won't sin. I want you to have all the sin that's in you. Now, honestly and truly, this never happened to me. Okay, true. But back in my day, young kids were known to slip around and smoke cigarettes. Okay? And that's the only thing you buy. Okay? Don't do it. Don't pick it up. Okay? But if I heard of parents that if they caught their child doing it, they would go out and buy a pack of cigarettes, put it right there on the desk in front of them, and say, start smoking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And let, let me assure you that by the time they got to about the sixth or eighth cigarette, they were ready to run the time that Okay? And so you want to smoke? You want to smoke all you want to. You want to sin? And again, the point is we desire them to be miserable in this life. But whatever. Whatever degree, and some of you perfectly pray for people you love and say, I pray that they'll be the most miserable person in the nation of the world. Some of you heard me pray that. And I mean it. I'm not kidding. It's not yet. To provide for those. Okay. And so, this is good for the health of the church, it's good for the world as they look at the church and say, there is a difference in these people. They, they, they demand a sort of Behavior. Has there been abuses in the name of church discipline? Of course, be absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? But that doesn't mean that it's not a biblical concept and a biblical practice that should be observed in the church. Third issue church discipline. Fourth, chapter six, lawsuit. Now, someone very close to me, many, many years ago, uh, had some, some serious health issues. And, uh, the doctor watched some things and they almost died. Okay? And they ran up tens of thousands, to even hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills. Okay, as a direct result. And guess what? The doctor and the hospital sent them the bill. They were back to back. They did. And so they were thinking they were we need to you know, have a lawsuit, we need to and their pastor told them, no, you can't do this. You can't sue someone else. Okay? Now, what was going on before? As a way of personal advancement, people were calling people into court. And by winning their case, they gained social status. That was kind of the background. So the first thing is, it involves a prohibition on Christians suing one another, I'm just using the word suing, going to court against each other. That those things should be resolved in the church. Okay? That there should be enough wise people in the church that they can prohibit something like that from airing of the public on. Okay? Now, I don't know that this, this really might work. I, we face this in a, in a Greek class, at least in the spirit text, the spirit issue. And uh, I came up with a very good solution. That when you take these issues to the church, if there can't be agreement and the right, the wrong can't be right, then the one that is judged as guilty should be disciplined by the church, but removed from the church as an unbeliever. And then the believer is free to fight. So the tax all that. Because prohibition is in front. Now that might be just a little bit too too snug and too snappy response. But the prohibition is that even to the extent when you're dealing with a fellow believer, maybe the best thing is to suck it up. Maybe the best thing is to I'll be wrong. I am not going to dishonor my Lord and Savior by making the public error of this this issue. Okay? And so uh, that's that's what's going on. Okay. All right, still in chapter 6. Sexual morals. We, we just spoke 
to do as it could be done today. And I'm, I'm more than convinced I've read a little bit more you know, on the subject of uh, what Andy Stanley was attempting to do with where his church was in the suburbs of the land of Georgia. And it seems to me uh, you know, he was uh, trying to round off the edges of uh, what the Bible says about intimate sexual uh, behavior. You know, remember what I said about the gospel is, is intense. That in and of itself it presupposes an indictment of sin. And notice verse 9, verse 3 through 6. For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What does that mean? Simple, play out of that, some of the Georgia English. The unrighteous ain't going to get Y'all clear about that? Alright. Do not be sued, neither the sexual immoral, nor louder, nor lower, nor the men who practice homosexuality. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? It's what? You know, it's one of the three answers. It's always, when I ask you a question, what's homosexuality? Thank you. Thank you. It's sin that can be forgiven, it's not an important sin, but it is not something that can be accepted, normalized, and finally celebrated within uh, the church. You know, I've told you before, and, and sometimes I think people think I'm, I'm always looking to debate and argue and get fight and all that, and I'm, I'm truly not that way. You know, and, but when you're pushed up against what the scripture says, and clearly says, then you have to say no, no, this is what it is. And so, what are we going to have to say to the culture and the individuals that make up the culture, that want to celebrate and call this? The wrong, this is a sin. Uh, I heard this morning uh, that one of the guys I listened to was saying that uh, the president has said, I forgot what the answer was, an unspeakable evil or something in regards to the Hamas and their attack upon uh, Israel. And that may be the only thing that have said, but I agree with that. I'm sure. Um, he may have said that it means, but I don't agree with that. I, I wouldn't take his word for it. I don't know if I'm it. According to the world view of his political party, how can you say that that is an unspeakable? If abortion's not evil, if homosexuality is not evil, and all of these other crazy things that they want to confirm and celebrate are not evil, why is this evil? You can't pick and choose. Either you define evil biblically or you just define it as the things that make evil. Yeah. How would you like to live in the world where it's the standard is just what ticks me off? Well, that's, that's the deal. Again, how, how can you even have the category? According to this godless worldview, there's no absolutes, there's no transcendent reality beyond what their opinion, what satisfies, what, what is their pleasure. Okay. Now, I just found that interesting that he would use that term. Beyond. Beyond. And that's a bit of an oddity. And so, what does it mean? Somewhere deep within his heart, that man knows that there's a real evil, and there's a real life, and there's a real truth, and that one day it's but he has so suppressed the truth, his conscience is so seared, his hard heart is so hard. Let's see. That is absolutely contradicting himself. I'll say that. Okay. So, the issue of sexuality, morality, uh, in general. Marriage and divorce, chapter uh, 7. Paul goes into some general. Principles, biblical principles, in regards to uh, marriage, okay? And so uh, there is a mutuality in marriage, and that uh, notice in verse 4 For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That there is a mutuality of ownership. Uh, for the blessing and the benefit of the participants 
to the hair. She says, a great deal more. I've told you before, I have heard people that profess to be Christians say something along this lines. I don't have to submit to my husband. None of these women here have to submit to their husbands. I went to that there the day got pulled out of the Bible. They asked say, you may disagree as to how I leave my home or how I teach on the subject of home. But just like we said about the issue of the doctrine of election and predestination, you may not agree with my view, but you can't say, well, I don't believe that stuff. Because what? It's right there in the Bible. It's right there in the Bible. The words are there. They mean something. Okay? Yeah. I don't think I'm wrong about it, but there can be some grounds for some disagreement. Again, you need to go dig it out for yourself and figure out what the Bible teaches. Okay? And so that's foundational um, to, to marriage. And here is, in, in this particular section, uh, Paul seems to give, at least uh, in my understanding, uh, an avenue uh, that allows for a divorce. You know, we do not desire divorce, we do not affirm. Divorce, we desire permanence in marriage. We believe that is biblical, that whatever issues are should be resolved, resolved particularly between uh, those that profess uh, to be believers. But notice what he says there in uh, verse 15. If the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not a slave, not to call them in peace. My understanding is. Somebody says, I'm done. I'm out. I'm gone. The remaining partner, the believing partner, categorized here, is not required to say something around the world. Please don't, please don't, please come back, please come back. Please come back. That, that marriage can end on uh, that ground. Now, that begs a lot of other questions. Is there freedom to, to, uh, to remarry and all those things? I'm not, I'm not even going to get in uh, to those issues. But we believe that the call of marriage is the picture of Christ and his great love in the church, that we must always fight and defend marriage, and that, again, there's at best a couple of reasons that Christians could avoid. One is one. And again, the idea of two believers. This goes back to we talk about church discipline. I mean, yeah. If you walk out on your mat, you are sinning. You have sinned. Okay? If you do not repent of it, you're in a professional state of sin. If you don't reconcile your mat, you're in a professional state of sin. And the church cannot stand silently by and say, that's okay. You don't get along, you don't get along. Getting along with the criteria? I heard a giggle. I got one giggle. I don't know who it was. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, that was my line. You come into my office, tell me to keep your married clothes. You say, I'm just not happy. What's Pastor Tim say? What's that got to do with marriage? There you go. There you go. Amen. Amen. I don't care. I don't care if you're happy or not. Ain't got nothing to do with me. Marriage should be a joyful discussion. But it's good. It's, it's, you have to fight for it. And we fight and we affirm them. From it because it's what's good for God's people, it's what is God's real, and ultimately it betrays. It, stay, it makes the state of the gospel to Jesus. So there's the issue. Seventh issue Marriage are matters of conscience. Okay? What's well, so the number one, at least in my life, the number one issue of conscience has to do with use or not use of alcohol. Okay? That, that's all it is. In fact, this what I'm talking about again. He's not a member of this church. You don't know him. Don't try to figure out who he is. You don't know him. Okay? But he was talking about that. He was in church. And from what I can gather, this guy was a non a Christian, faithful member in another church. And he was at a church where the guy tried to make everybody kind of sign it off. To do this, 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 all along with this. And they said they would do it. And a lot of other things, but he decided it was better that I go somewhere else. I said, Well, 
I do not teach that you know, alcohol is absolutely prohibited in you know, any association with alcohol is a sin. I would warn against it. My preference is you don't use it. I think it's very dangerous. If you're not 21 years old, it's a sin. Period. Just let me get that out there. Period. Period. End of the discussion. Okay? Your parents say you can't. End of the discussion. Okay? But um, that is a matter of conscience. Some people say, well, somebody sees you, it destroys your uh, witness. Well, maybe. Or maybe it's an opportunity for you to talk about certain liberties in Christ. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. That's a matter of conscience, okay? And that, in, in my growing up, I can remember days that when alcohol began to serve in some of the little restaurants around, uh, our, not in my hometown, but in the towns that we would go out to dinner, and, uh, my parents would quit going to those places. They didn't want to be seen, they didn't want to that. And that was probably a little bit legalistic, okay? And that, that was their tendency because of the kind of context that they. Uh, lived in, but they didn't want to be a poor witness. They were not buying alcohol in a restaurant like that. They didn't want to be associated with it. Some people feel the same way about this. I don't want somebody to see me going into a multiplex. They'll think I'm going to the, you know, the triple R, X, G, Y, you know, whatever, movie, when I'm going to see Andy or something. You know? <laughs> so, but you see what I'm saying? There are issues that just aren't black and white. But Christians have to make choices. And we have to be discerning. And we have to be able to allow people to liberty in these matters of conscience and stay uh, in fellowship uh, with one another. Okay? Matters of conscience, chapter 8. The eighth thing, uh, women in the church. Now, he doesn't get into the issue so much in terms of uh, what he does later in 1 Timothy. Uh, related to the qualifications for eldership within uh, the church. Uh, suffice it to say, I'm absolutely, I'm 100% convinced uh, that the Bible does not affirm women holding the office of elder in the church. Okay? The pastor. Okay? And I'll go so far also that they should not teach and have authority over me. Okay? Uh, so, uh, okay. There's some souls. In fact, a good friend of mine pastors a mega church. Not in the state. You don't know him. You've never met him. Okay? You don't know who he is. But he called me last week with that. And not, they weren't having a big room to all. They just said, here's some things, and what do you think? And, and asking me about these passages. And I said, we must really go a while since I looked at them uh, really uh, closely. Uh, the suggestions and places that he could uh, look. I mean, they're not allowed to ordain women or anything like that. <coughs> how, how do you uh, utilize the women that are gifted to ministry uh, in uh, the church? Now, in chapter 11, this very strange thing, I'm not even going to try to resolve it for you tonight. But let me just say, it. Sunday morning, you women are going to pray cross side, bring the head covers, okay? All right? I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And so, uh, you have to understand what prophesying. And there's a whole debate about what that is. But I can't what it ain't. I can't what prophesying ain't. It ain't preaching. Okay? Whatever was going on, it wasn't preaching. But again, he calls for this, and we can talk about that uh, later. But notice what he says in chapter 14, which is as problematic as that. Uh, verse uh, 33. God is my God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. So, what does he mean? Well, he's already said, if you're going to pray cross side, you put it on the wall. Speak. Right? If you're going to do that, you've got to do it with the echo. Okay? Now, uh, then he comes back here and says, well, we've got to remain silent. So, again, what does he mean? And from my understanding, and I, I have, I didn't do a PhD on this passage, okay? so, uh, but he is not speaking of an absolute prohibition of women that are saying anything in the midst of the congregation, uh, certainly in terms of seeing uh, things that we would normally think of as for being involved in uh, the church. And uh, there's uh, a friend of mine was telling me about something going on. 
gives the people to come to class and then a very profound doctrine of error being a and being a fucking pastor. I, I don't need it. It's not my church, it's not my place, but you really do. And he did. <laughs> the next time you talk about it, this is my one. He, he, he told me what she said, the next teacher she said about the city. And she got it right, she's right on the Bible. And said, whoa, 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 what now? She what she said. Now, that's a bit of it. It's teaching a Sunday school class, exercising authority over men. Uh, we really don't do many Sunday school classes here, which ladies teach. Okay? Now, we can argue, we can bat it back and forth. You know, but that's just we don't we don't do it, okay? And um, so it's something uh, that we can talk about. Suffice it to say, uh, I think most likely we can look at the head government business as a cultural thing. I'm not really open to somebody exercising this so called gift of prophecy uh, in, our, in our time. Uh, I, I, there have been a lot of things that have to be worked out in that particular issue. I do not think it's the science is absolutely. When you walk in the door, you can't say no more. I don't think that's what's going to happen. But it's an interesting subject, and it's something that brings about quite a bit of uh, angst in a lot of uh, And let me just take this both in the church and the homes. I think I've seen men being oppressive despots as often as I've seen women in the belly. So you can, whatever role you have, husband or wife, man or woman, you shouldn't sin a little bit. So, women in church. The ninth thing. See, is, it, is, is that the right time to stop? Everybody's mad about something. And, uh, nobody's mad. I must be talking about it. Alright, charismatic gifts. Uh, chapter 12 deals with kind of in general uh, the, the um, uh, various types of, of gifts. He gets into the details of prophecy and tongues more specifically. Now, I am not the classic John MacArthur dispensational cessation in here. Uh, that's really not where I am. But for all practical purposes and intents, I'm a cessation. Okay? I had no idea. But um, the gift of prophecy, certainly under the old covenant, was a gift of speaking revelatory information. It certainly continued in the life of the apostles as they were inspired to, to preach and to write scripture. It may have extended slightly further out uh, from that. But I, I believe for the most part, uh, prophecy uh, is not a gift that is essential to the church, but we have to close the hand. And if we close the hand, if that's your doctrine, then every, everything the prophet says has to be handed to the hand. It does not. Uh, I think. So, so I, I'm not on board. Uh, you can read John Piper and Wayne Group. They're, they're slightly open to some things. I often say I'm not quite as close as John MacArthur. I'm not quite as open as Wayne Group and John Exactly. But it is a problem. God told me to tell you. Okay, that, that's, that, that's really, I mean, I'm deeply convinced I need to talk to you about this. And, and I really believe the Lord has convicted my heart. And I really need to, now that's a different pattern. That's a different follower. But I will be careful. And, and I grew up in churches, let me tell you something. It, it was very common for the preacher to talk about what God told me. Okay, we weren't carried back. That was just kind of the accepted Lincoln. I think I would suggest be very, very careful about that particular uh, issue. Issue of tongues. I'm convinced that what went on with that Pentecost was there were people that did not speak uh, Aramaic or whatever it was that Peter was normally speaking in. And as Peter spoke, they heard him speak in their language, the language they understood, a known, recognizable, well defined language. Okay? That's what happened. Pentecost. Okay? It happened a few other times as recorded in the book of Acts. There is nothing in the scripture that makes me think that people, you know, having spasms and flopping like 
like chicken and spit flying everywhere and swallowing their tongues and gobbling you is anything of God. Okay? That's my position. And listen, if you're inclined to speak in tongues, I will interpret it for you. But you just pledge $250,000 right there. Thank you for that. Okay? So you just, you just, you just rear back and let it fly. Okay? But can God still do that? Absolutely. Can God bridge the communication? Yeah. Absolutely. But the other stuff, I think it's much nonsense. Maybe you just can in some cases. Okay? But if you have a need to speak to a Russian and God confirms, listen, this guy's from pure gospel and pure from you, and he makes people have any bridges that might be prayer, then he's only God. Because he's still the same God that gave people that God is the same God now as he was 2,000 years. I've heard one gentleman that I respect correctly, the late Larry Draper. Larry just preached here. Uh, he preached in one week, you know, probably six months or when I, I saw him. And he preached longer than I did, believe, believe it or not. He was longer than I did. But, uh, very fine preacher. But he said he thinks that happened in the Russian mission. That he was trying to communicate, that I was trying to translate, and he was just going nowhere. And he was talking, and the guy said, totally translated. He understood. So, so that's my take on, on charismatic gifts. Final issue uh, the gospel and salvation. Again, we need to be really clear about what the gospel is. And I think Paul gives as concise a definition of what the gospel is. Right in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you as a first importance, for I also received that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried and raised on the third day, in accordance with the scripture, and he appeared to see us. There's the gospel. That's the testimony of the person who went to the cross. The gospel is something that we've heard outside of you. We get in evangelicalism and Southern Adventism and Southern Confusion, but the gospel is about something that happened to you. The gospel is something that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ across the Calvary. When he was substitute, he was your substitute, he experienced the wrath of God for you. That is the good news. That is uh, the gospel. Notice also what he says. That um, this gospel that preached back in verse 1, you received it, you stand in it, you're being saved with what? You hold back. You persevere. You continue in faith. There's that concept again. And so uh, the gospel is, is tied to the historical reality of the resurrection. Paul unpacks that. Very clearly, the essential nature of the resurrection. Now, again, I told you, in my growing up, kind of the boogeyman, the false teacher, or what we call liberal servants, they like to be called progressives, and I don't sound nice. But, uh, but there were not all of them at this point that they would deny the liberal bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think maybe the most, most notorious example now is Martin Martyr, and the deep, uh, in it still. But they're right there out there. Okay. I mean, they're for that. I don't even I don't know why they would be thinking themselves as Christians or religious or you know, I don't I don't know what they're doing in the resurrection. But um, but we still need to stand for the historical, physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Christ be not right, we are all men the most miserable. But we're being found to be Necessary. Don't let anybody say, well, you know, just they thought he was raised, and that was enough to propel them on that. You don't get crucified upside down just because you know, kind of have a big one for the next okay. You don't stand faithful to that, uh, testifying to something that really didn't happen. It, it, it didn't happen. Christ uh, is raised. You might, you might throw in one other thing. Look at verse 22 there in chapter 15. For it is an Adam all that. Also in Christ shall all be made alive. We're going to talk about some alls on Sunday or another all on Sunday this week. But uh, so for all that we say, all are in Adam. Are those two alls equal? Some plants. No. Every every individual is in Adam. That's universal. But not everyone will be made alive. Okay. There's a difference uh, in the meaning of the uh, two halls there. And I'm quite a careful reader. Good exegete of the two halls in uh, text. Okay.
Okay. Well, those are 10 things. Anybody mad yet? Yeah. Thank y'all. I, I enjoy doing this. Everybody knows I like doing follow the rules. Uh, I will. Y'all try to get out of here at 745? You're on the middle of the song, y'all. Okay. Right. Any questions that I can answer? That would be exciting. It would really make my day. I mean, at least you say, don't tell me I'm saying. I mean, you know, anyway, I'm there. One of these is a question. Come on, gentlemen. <laughs> now, so we're all in 100% agreement that I told you you're absolutely true. You're, you're with me, right? Amen. Unity of spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. May we never take life the opportunity to write the divine and proclaim the truth. Lord, I think it's fine to find great pleasure and enjoy these things. I hope that it has been enjoyed tonight. But the thing that we desire more is that you give us clarity in our understanding and clarity of your speech and that these people will hear that which uh, must be heard that which is necessary uh, for their growth in your spirit. We can bring these things in our hearts and minds. But I ask these things in Jesus.